Okay folks, back again for Legend of Korra Season 4, Episode 2 Vlog, Korra Alone. So the obvious thing about this one, right from the title, uh, this, is, this episode is a reference to Season 2 of Avatar The Last Airbender, Zuko Alone. Uh, the structures of the episodes are very similar. They both have our character, uh, our title character, Korra Zuko traveling on their own and having flashbacks to past events, filling in things about their character. Um, they're very different, though. Uh, this episode also draws very heavily on another episode from Season 2 of Avatar The Last Airbender, Appa's Lost Days. Um, in that episode, Appa had been gone for several episodes, he, we then get an episode that traces where he's been during that time. Kind of fitting him in around the edges of the last several episodes of that season. And this episode kind of takes that idea too, in that we have Korra, uh, who was absent for most of last week's episode. Now, we see where she's been, not just in that time, but for the last three years. Uh, we see why she disappeared. We see kind of how she felt about that time period. Um, in both cases, it gives us a lot of insight into where the character is now by showing us where they've been in terms of their emotional journey. Um, both Appa's Lost Days and Zuko Alone did that for their characters, and here we see an episode doing it for Korra. Um, the reason I bring up Appa's Lost Days is that it kind of reminds me of that in the sense that Appa is much more alone in Appa's Lost Days than Zuko is in Zuko Alone. Despite the title, Zuko spends very little time alone in Zuko Alone. A little bit at the beginning, a little bit at the end. But for most of it, he's either acting out the plot of the movie Shane with the Earthbender family, or he's living with his family back in the Fire Kingdom, and for most of the flashbacks, it's a period when he was relatively okay. His life wasn't perfect. Um, Ozai did not magically become an abusive douchebag the day he burned Zuko. He kind of was one all along. But his life was not alone. He had family, he had people around him, and in both time periods we see in that episode. In this episode, however, Korra is very much alone in the present day. Um, really, the only other people she talks to are entirely unnamed, who come on for one scene and are then gone. Uh, the two old people uh, in whatever village that was she was visiting. Um, very funny bit, by the way, of adult Aang doing the young Aang spinning the marbles pose. Um, they actually rather reminded me of characters from yet another episode of Avatar The Last Airbender, Season 1's The Storm, which also had heavy emphasis on flashbacks. So they're really drawing very heavily on the previous series while doing lots of flashbacks. It's a fun little way to make that multi-layered. We've got the flashbacks of the characters, but we've also got the viewers having flashbacks to... Avatar The Last Airbender while they're watching this. Unfortunately, that gets into one of the episode's weaknesses that I'll talk about in a little bit. But for now, that's a pretty cool trick they're pulling. On top of that, we've got, like I was saying, Korra is traveling very much alone in the present, and it kind of shows how, in a sense, she felt very alone in the past, even though she was surrounded by people in the South Pole. She had her family, she had the support of Katara, she had her friends writing to her. She felt very alone. She even deliberately isolated herself by not writing to them. Now, deliberately, she, she says it's because she didn't know what to say. But that's very telling, because they're her friends. She's never had any trouble talking to Asami and Bolin before. She's never had... I mean, she's had trouble communicating with Mako, but she's never had any trouble having words come out of her mouth in his direction. Um, there's never been a problem there, but for now, as she's been injured, as she's feeling very bad about herself, she creates one. 
she quote unquote doesn't know what to say to them, what that really means is she is full of anxiety about talking to them because she's afraid that they are going to confirm her fears about herself, that she is broken, that she is not the person she once was. Because remember, the very first words out of her mouth in the entire series were, I'm the Avatar, you've got to deal with it. Now, she is in a very real sense not the Avatar. She does not have, you know, she always reveled in her physical abilities. Now they're gone because she's been poisoned, she's injured, she's still recovering. She feels broken. She feels like she's lost who she is. And in that process, she's lost that sense of I'm the Avatar. She's lost the ability to access the Avatar state, which just compounds the fact that only a year prior, she had lost access to the Avatars of the past. And it's just the thing people do. Sometimes when you feel alone, that makes you feel like you don't deserve to be with other people, which makes you seek out being alone even more. It traps you in a loop. It's a very common symptom of depression and social anxiety, and I think it's fair to say that Cora is rather depressed. Not in the colloquial, oh, she's sad sense, but in a very real, clinical way. Um, she is suffering from depression brought on by an extremely traumatic experience. Her, her beating and resulting disability at the hands of Zahir. And throughout the episode, she shows signs of how traumatized she is by this. She keeps seeing him. But interestingly, it's not him that she keeps running into the most. She sees him when she's under direct attack. But the rest of the time, what she sees is herself. And more specifically, the Avatar. Because although she says she's on a quest to find how to get back the Avatar state, the fact of the matter is, she keeps meeting herself in the Avatar state, and every time she does, she runs away, or she attacks. She is afraid. She is having a flight or fight response to her own Avatar self. She is afraid of being the Avatar, because being the Avatar is what nearly got her killed, is what cost her her ability to walk and to fight. Being the Avatar has caused her immense pain, and she's running away from it. That is perhaps the biggest sense in which she's alone, because she's running away from herself. She's abandoned herself. She no longer has herself, and therefore she has nothing. This is, this is a pretty heavy episode. Unfortunately, the frequent callbacks to Avatar The Last Airbender and specifically to some of Avatar The Last Airbender's best and most heartbreaking episodes, is kind of a flaw here, because this is, a, this is a heavy episode. This is a good episode. This is not a great episode. This is not an episode that had me going, oh wow, this is some of the best television I've ever seen, the way that The Storm or Zuko alone made me sit up and say, oh wow, Avatar The Last Airbender is some of the best television I've ever seen. And so by calling back to it, the episode, in a way, actually makes itself seem worse than it is. Because it is a good episode, it's just not as good. Of course, all these references to Avatar The Last Airbender are building up to the end of the episode and the reveal of Toph, which, you know, it makes total sense. Toph is exactly the person that Korra needs to talk to right now, because what Korra needs to do is stop being afraid. She needs to confront her, her avatar self. I suspect that, given that the spirit was able to see it, that that is actually Rava taking the form of Katara in the avatar state. But, but regardless of who or what that is, she needs to confront her avatar self, not try to drive it off or avoid it, or turn away from it, or escape it, but meet it head on. Which is a reference to another second season episode, Bitter Work, which 
was about Aang and Zuko learning new approaches to their problems. And Aang was taught to confront things head-on by Toph. It's exactly the role that's needed. Um, it's also fascinating that she now lives in the swamp. Because the swamp in The Last Airbender, after The Last Airbender, symbolized the interconnectedness of all things. It was a mangrove swamp. And the interesting thing about mangrove swamps is that all the trees in them, or almost all, uh, can vary. Sometimes you can get isolated ones, but as a general rule, the trees in a mangrove swamp are actually all one plant, interconnected. The same is true of the Avatar world. Everything in it is interconnected, and that's what the swamp represents. It's going to be interesting to see how things are, how in the next couple of episodes things are interconnected for Katara. Katara, I wish, for Korra because she is, you know, the avatar, the source of balance in the world, but she's also feeling isolated and alone. She needs to feel that sense of being connected. And she is connected to everything that's going on. Uh, Mako is connected to Prince Wu and to Korra. Bolin is connected to Kuvira and Korra. Asami is connected to Republic City and Korra. Um, the airbenders are sp spread all over the world are connected through Tenzin to Korra. She does have personal links to everything in the world. And through her past life, she's connected to Toph and thereby to the swamp. So it'll be interesting to see how these connections are explored and exactly what connections it is that are able to bring Katara back to her... S I did it again. Are able to bring Korra back to herself, and able to bring her to meet herself, confront herself, and again become one with herself. So far, I'm digging this season. Obviously, it's got a long way to go, but so far, so good. They're doing some good stuff. Like I said, I'm still a little annoyed that nobody can seem to think of any stories to tell about the female avatar other than she loses her powers. Because again, that's very typical for female superheroes. But at least they're doing a good job with the story they've got. They're executing it well. And we'll see what happens. And that's about all I've got on this one. This was a relatively straightforward one. Mostly just setting us up for things to come. Definitely got to say, now that we know that all three of Toph Katara and Zuko are still kicking and running around. I am looking forward to the three of them kicking some ass together. I want that. Some kind of equivalent to the White Lotus liberating Ba Sing Se. I, I, heck, even could be the three of them liberating Ba Sing Se. That would be pretty great. Uh, but I want to see them together kicking ass one more time. In particular because she hasn't because she hasn't gotten to do it all season and because having to be a healer and nothing else was a big sticking point for her at the end of season one of Avatar the Last Airbender. Um, I really want to see Katara kick some butt. I, I want to see her just utterly destroy someone. Um, you know, not lethally, but... Just some kind of serious ass-kicking victory for Katara. And just seeing Zuko and Toph back in action again would be pretty sweet. Anyway, we'll see. Like I said, I have no... Even though, uh, as I talk right now recording this, we're up to episode 6. I have not seen any of that. I do not know what happens in any of that. I've been deliberately avoiding spoilers. Literally all I know is what is in the trailer and what has happened in these two episodes so far. So... Continuing on, and I'll talk to you all next week.